like to invite everyone to please stand as we call on our visiting pastor for this evening, Reverend, Reverend Floyd Hillman, who will open us in a word of prayer, and then we will have the national anthem. Good afternoon to all. Shall we pray? Father, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We bless you and thank you because there is none like you. There is none that can be compared to you. You deserve all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. We thank you, Lord, that this nation is still a God-fearing one. It is so good that in St. Lucia, you are honored in this way. We thank you because prayers are still an essential part of the agenda in government functions. Lord, you said in your word, I will honor them that honor me. So honor us today with your presence. Today we are thankful for this group of St. Lucians who have lived overseas for a number of years but have made the decision to return to the land of their birth at this time. We pray that their reorientation into the St. Lucian society and culture will be a pleasant one. And even if they have the occasional unpleasant experience, help them to be gracious and to be thankful to you anyhow. Lord, they are returning with a wealth of information and experience, and I pray that they will freely share these with the rest of our St. Lucian society. I pray also for Dr. Fletcher, who is at the head of this initiative, grant to her wisdom and grace, O oh God, as she goes about this very important task. I pray that you will bless our proceedings today, and I pray that whatever is done this afternoon will be pleasing in your sight. God, once again, be magnified. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. Remain standing for the national anthem of St. Lucia. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You may please be seated. Let me take this opportunity to thank you to this meeting and discussion of diaspora affairs in St. Lucia. As most of you would have noted, the Ambassador, Her Excellency, Dr. Joyce Lynn Fletcher, has arranged a number of town hall meetings outside of St. Lucia. So she's gone 
I don't know if Cayenne is so far, but she's gone. That was the last place she just came from. Cayenne, she's been to the UK. She's been to a few cities in the US. And we're here in St. Lucia. You're not last, but they always say you save the best for last. Yes? So we're here today to present to you the returnees or the International Association members of St. Lucians to present to you, perhaps you've heard a lot of what is happening in St. Lucia, and perhaps you've had a lot of misinformation, and tonight is an opportunity for you to hear straight from the horse's mouth what is happening in St. Lucia, what are the opportunities available, and I'm sure there would be opportunities as well for there to be a discourse in perhaps seeking clarification from your end if there's anything that you wish to clarify. To begin our proceedings this evening, I would like to invite the ambassador to present the diaspora resource team. As you know, um, no man is an island, and there's nothing that we do that we can accomplish on our own. And so please put your hands together and welcome the ambassador as she introduces to us her diaspora resource team. As um, Mrs. Charles said, no man is an island, and this initiative could not succeed in St. Lucia without the help of two groups. Now, one group was already established, I found them here. But this diaspora team, I'm going to tell you a little more about them when I speak to you. But I need to let you know and let St. Lucia know that these people are not paid by the government of St. Lucia. I think all they get are coffee and cookies. And they come together to assist the office of the Diaspora Affairs Unit simply because they are committed to the social and economic development of St. Lucia and that they believe that the diaspora matter, that you are important, that your contribution to St. Lucia is important and that they have partnered with us to assist you, to answer your questions, to give it to you direct in any area, and I told them the areas that was important, the areas that you were questioning me about. So I went to them because, you know, I may be a doctor, but I don't know a third of anything, and therefore I needed that team. I'm going to begin that in the customs department, and you know Diaspora have a whole lot of questions about port charges and all the, the, the things and what Diaspora is, what is being done, the government is being done for the Diaspora when it comes to port charges. And of course we have Mr. Elisha Nassis on that team. We also have Ms. Camille Michel from Invest St. Lucia. Invest St. Lucia have a whole lot of them. Eh? We have um, Mr. Philbert Lubrin. We have Ms. Sherlyn Elidor. Now, let me tell you, every time the group meets, they are certain that somebody from Invest St. Lucia must be there. Okay, so I'm going on. We have Mr. Jason Bidal from Expo St. Lucia and Ms. Lisa Evans from Expo St. Lucia. So one is always there. Now, I'm saying mostly these are not junior officers. These are senior officers, and you'll hear later on how such senior people can take time off their jobs and come and meet in a meeting with me in the office of the Prime Minister, or meet with the diaspora via Zoom, di diaspora representatives. That's how much they care. That's how much you matter, and your concerns matter to them. Okay, we have Mr. Cuthbert, and now I always can't say his last name well, but if I make a mistake, Cuthbert, please forgive me. It is Cuthbert McDiarmid. All right, I said it well. And Mr. McDiarmid is the project coordinator at Proud. And you know people want to buy house, government houses? He will answer that. Mr. Vincent Bolan, who is the managing director of SLDB. You see Mr. Bolan is here. And... Um, 
he is not the only one, but you know, they're always present and he's here. Now, imagine a managing director. I mean, you can't get better than that. Then we have Mr. Medford Francis, who is the deputy manager of Bank of St. Lucia. So when you're asking all kinds of business, I can't open an account in St. Lucia. I cannot put my money here to invest. I cannot do this. They will answer your questions and tell you what is happening in St. Lucia. So the information you're getting is wrong. They have the information about what is happening and they have things target directly for diaspora to enable you to invest, to trade, to give back. Then we also have Mr. Glad Taylor, who is uh, the CEO of um, Vision Express and the private real estate. So persons who want to buy private real estate, he answers those questions. We have Mr. Sorosa Snack. Now that's our legal eagle. Sorosa, I, I hope I said it well. Mr. Sorosa, right? Okay, you're okay. This gorgeous young man is a legal eagle. And he has worked in the Attorney General's office. And when our team puts together policies that, direct, that, that directly affect and impact the diaspora, they are there to put it together to take it to cabinet. Nothing is left undone for the diaspora. So you're getting it today. Let no one fool you. You can ask your questions. They're here today. We also have Mr. Allison Matre, who is the executive director of SSDF. Now I'm going to tell you, diaspora, exactly what this young man and his team has done for the diaspora. And they've gone so far that they have even signed an MOU with the Union of St. Lucia Overseas Associations. So I don't want to preempt my delivery, so I'm, I'm just introducing them. Then we have Mr. John Labadee, who is the chief surveyor in the um, Ministry of Physical Planning. A lot of people want to buy government land. A lot of people want to know have problems with their land. And so he is there to answer those questions for you. And I will tell you later what they do and how they do it and let you know how involved they are and all they get, coffee, sandwich, and cookies. And they come and sit and they're committed. And so most of the representatives are here. Could some, would you just stand, those of you here, so that um, of my diaspora team, resource team, so that the people can see you here and know that they, they really exist. And let us give them a resounding round of applause. They are a very important group of people. And St. Lucia will be hearing a lot more about those people, because I am extremely grateful for them. Thank you very much. And I call them the extension of the Office of Diaspora Affairs. I came to St. Lucia and I met that team when I started this office. And of course, a year prior to that, I knew when I was offered this job, I decided to work with them before I ever came to St. Lucia so I could prepare myself when I get here. What I did on the phone and in emails was nothing compared to what happened in person. These two, these two groups have been fantastic, but the SLI, St. Lucia International Association, that they have a North group and a South group, and what they do is that if you, they are made of persons who were in the diaspora, worked for years in the diaspora, came back, and are investing and giving back. And when you in the diaspora want to come back to St. Lucia, they help you reintegrate into the society. So once my office knows you're coming in, we tell them, so if you're going in the north, the north take care of you. If you're going in the south, the south take care of you. We're the only island, only country in the region. And I have been going to other regions and I've been boasting and I'm proud that only St. Lucia has an SLIA. Now Nancy is going to tell you about their names and so on, but I just want them to stand up. The international group, please stand up so that the people can give them a resounding round of applause. They are the extension staff of the St. Lucia Diaspora Unit, the St. Lucia International Association Diaspora Unit. That's what I call them. Thank you. Nancy will tell you. The, go on. 
just by way of introduction of the leaders of the two chapters, as Dr. Fletcher indicated, we have a southern group and we have a northern group. The chairperson of the southern group is my auntie, Auntie Lucille Fontenelle. Oko, please stand. Oh yes, I have to say it's my auntie. And the chairperson of the northern group, well, I can call you auntie as well, is that okay? Okay. She's none other than Maura Bernard. Thank you very much. I sat down and I was writing and I was like, wow. Um, I was not very pleased, I have to tell you, audience, um, with the applause for the team that the ambassador has put together and for the generosity of the time that the members from Customs, Invest St. Lucia, St. Lucia Development Bank, Bank of St. Lucia, Proud, Vision Express, AG Chambers, SSDF, and our Chief Surveyor, I would like you to give them another resounding round of applause to thank them and to appreciate them for their hard work and the effort in ensuring that our fellow St. Lucians when they come back home, they make sure that they are comfortable and there are processes and procedures that will enable them to go through smoothly in integrating back into St. Lucia. So thank you very much. But ladies and gentlemen, um, he needs no introduction. He's a, he's a gentleman of many talents, Leslie. You've surprised me over the last couple of weeks. But I would like to introduce Mr. Leslie Colimo who is the chair of the Return Diaspora Youth Entrepreneurs to speak to you this evening. He's going to use a cordless mic and so he's going to be down. He's not going to come up there. I think he needs to be a bit more interactive with you. So he will be addressing you from down below. Please put your hands together and welcome Mr. Colimo. Yeah, how do we talk about my experience, our experience? It was in another presentation that I was making to Ambassador Fletcher. And she looked surprised that there were individuals on the island who could do certain things in business. And I said, well, you know, home have. Home have. So that is the title of the presentation today, home have. So a little about myself, just so that you know who you, who's speaking to you. My name is Leslie Collimore. I'm the principal consultant of Advanced Intellectual Methods. This is a short, that's the Reader's Digest version of what I've been able to accomplish. Um, former head of marketing at Digicel, former assistant marketing manager at ECFH group of companies, former group marketing manager at MNC group of companies. I was 25 years old. I have no idea if MNC knew what they were doing at the time. Um, Associate Consultant at Google on the Google Earth Project, um, e-marketing officer at the St. Lucia Tourist Board, trainee analyst at Surveillance. That is something that I hardly ever share with anybody. And Surveillance is the offshoot of the Central Intelligence Agency, and they are responsible for really developing applications to predict bad things. So I had the opportunity to, to work there a long time ago post 9-11. Um, teen Center Director at the Boys and Girls Club, President of the St. Lucia Basketball Federation, U.S. green card holder. I had to put that in there to let you know it is a choice to be here, to come back and to contribute. It is a choice. So that is very, very important. So what's not on there? I'm a father of two boys, and they are my motivation for everything. Right, okay. So, let's move on a little bit. Who's him? Really? We are management consultancy. We focus on strategic marketing. We focus on innovation. And we focus on digital media. That's really what we are. That's it. But this is not about me and my company. It's bigger than that. Much bigger. It's bigger than me. I represent a group of returned diaspora who have lived worked and played all over the world 
but return home to contribute professionally, economically, socially, and civically. We returned by choice. And this is just a group of the skill sets that we have. Finance and banking, medicine, logistics, aeronautics, marketing, destination management, project management, web and mobile application development, culinary arts, performing arts, professional athletes. Anybody ever heard of Terrence Mann? No, he's an NBA player. All right, Chris Boucher, NBA player for the Toronto Raptors. There are a few of them out there. That's set, these are solutions. Fashion designers, information technology, computer science, a makeup artist. There's an individual who has her own line of makeup, and she's St. Lucian and resides in the diaspora. Telecommunications regulators, engineers, accountants, mobile technology, entrepreneurship, investment services, and the list can go on and on and on. So again, it's bigger than me. It's a large group of individuals. Our collective mantra, learn, earn, return, right? We went out, we got an education, we worked, we developed a skill, we built a network all over the world, we gained experience, we earned respect and recognition, maybe made some money. You see I underlined and I put asterisks by that, I really wasn't sure, so I just stuck that in there. Knowledge sharing, very important, and we believe it's our civic duty to actually come back and give back. Right, so, a few members of the team here today. Ms. Peta Luizzi, undergraduate degree in mathematics from Pace University. Graduate, Master of Science in Applied Data Science from Syracuse University. So, I want to share a statistic with you. For the first time in human history, the price of data has surpassed the price of oil. To just put that in perspective, data has surpassed the price of oil. Information is everything in the 21st century. She loves to laugh. Needless to say, she's very, very smart. She's a US passport holder. She's an American citizen, and she's back in St. Lucia. Petal, where are you? Petal, please stand. Please stand, Petal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next. Gideon Augustine. He is the um, managing director of a company called Idle Tech. He's an information communication technology professional. He's a PMP, a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science with honors. He's worked and lived regionally and internationally and brought his skills back home to contribute as well. Next up. Rankin Morgan. Rankin needs no introduction. The managing director of 123 Digital, the premier digital marketing agency on the island. He's also, the, he's also a publisher. He runs the Dazzle magazine. I don't know how many of you have ever seen the Dazzle magazine. Um, impressively, he's been able to expand to St. Vincent and Barbados. So again, you have Rankin here. Rankin gained his experience from the, in the United Kingdom and Trinidad and Tobago. That's where he earned his chops, but again, decided to come back home. All right. Why our diaspora is so important? Diaspora is sizable, skilled, well-educated, and oftentimes affluent. That last part, I have no knowledge of that, but I see some good people in the crowd. I would dare to say that you probably fit that mold. Shared heritage and strong national connections. That is very important. You know, we ought to support our own. If I am looking to partner with somebody, I will always look to partner with my own first, and then my regional counterpart, and then probably move out after that. Instrumental in financial, social, but more importantly, human capital investments. My decision to come back to St. Lucia was because ev almost everybody who goes away to school, they stay away, they get opportunities, they work, they live, and they stay away. How are, we, how are we supposed to build a nation if nobody comes back? I came back. 
can solve many of the socioeconomic and environmental issues that we always seem to rely on governments and external agencies to face. The diaspora have a breadth of experience in a lot of issues. We need to tap into that, leverage that experience, leverage that knowledge, and fix things. It's not always the government, and I am apolitical. I don't really care about that sort of thing. However, I understand the importance of it. Let's, the diaspora is there, let's use them, let's fix things. But, there is an issue. So I heard all of the wonderful things. I had brief discussions with Her Excellency about the plans. However, we don't know where to look. How many of the diaspora coming back are aware of all of these things and all of these plans and know where to look? Anybody? I mean, they're wonderful plans, but do we know where to get that information? And I know we're just starting off, but this is our experience. Those of us who have come back, we did it blindly. We would always look to partner with and support our own. But where do we connect with each other in a central space? And in the 21st century, a central space doesn't have to be in the town hall with the wonderful air conditioning. <laughs> it, it, it can be done digitally. Right? So that's one of the things that we need to, to look at. And I, and I hazard a guess and say that the, the team being the, the newly minted chair of the, what's it? Diaspora, youth diaspora entrepreneurs, we, we should be putting a proposal together to create some sort of database and space where we can seamlessly transfer all these wonderful plans that Her Excellency spoke about, right? Additionally, many of us don't have a seat at the table to contribute meaningfully. All of these plans are being made. Now that I can say, oh, well, you know I'm a chair. I've gotten a seat, but it's, it's, not about, it's not about plans being made outside of us and excluding us. We, we need to be there, not because of nepotism, we need to be there because we've, we've earned that spot. We've worked for it, we've gained the experience. We just need to be able to give some input. What support services and systems are there to support the effort locally, regionally, and internationally? So you can see this was completely not scripted. There is a support team that is in place now. And again, let's take some time and, and give Her Excellency and her team and the Office of the Diaspora a round of applause for that. See that? And that's locally, the effort locally, regionally, and internationally. The diaspora is everywhere. So, you know, I like numbers. Numbers never, people lie, numbers don't. 90% of Caribbean diaspora want to engage more formally with the region and the sources will bank. This is not just me pulling numbers or Petal, the mathematician and data scientist, just spitting things out. This is from the World Bank. My diaspora story. See these three images? That's my story. That's me, if you couldn't figure it out. First slide. So, I figured, you know what? We always, always allow, for various reasons, foreigners to come in, set up, do business, and leave. So I figured, you know what? I'm going to return the favor. I am going to tap into the diaspora because I have services that I can provide to the diaspora in other source markets. So I went to New York. So I figured, all right, where's the diaspora? I happened upon Ambassador Richardson's office to get some information. I was searching, where do I go to find them? Who do I target? I was lost in New York City. So. All these things you see there, lost, confused, unsure, unclear, perplexed, disoriented, bewildered, and the word of the day, flummoxed <laughs> at the inability for me to get information and to start business. So that is my diaspora story. It is deeply personal. So I am very pleased that the office of Her Excellency is strategically putting these things in place so that it'll be easier to pave the road for those who are coming up behind us. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. I know we have some flag mafia, 
That may not be the actual color of the flag. I do not wish to hear your comments and your feedback. All I would like right now probably is some applause and some, this was fantastic. If you have a flag comment, keep it to yourself. And remember, say it, let's do it together. Thank you. As we continue, um, I know in Mr. Colimo's presentation, he asked about what is happening and where do you find out. Perhaps tonight is one of those nights where you find out. Um, so Ambassador, before I call you, I know that Slasper is here and the government of St. Lucia is currently undertaking a huge project in the south, which is the Hiranora International Airport Redevelopment Project. Um, it is one of the flagship projects of this government and I think it is one of the projects perhaps our traveling community would appreciate when it is completed, that you can walk into St. Lucia in style and you won't have to get wet and you can be comfortable when you are walking and say, mm hmm I'm a home. Welcome to St. Lucia, right? Okay, so I will call on Mr. Peter Lewis, who is the Communications and Community Liaison Officer for the Huanora International Redevelopment Project, who will make a brief presentation followed by a video presentation of the project. You say a town hall meeting, but it feels a little more posh than that. You know, a town hall meeting, you come in your t-shirt and, you know, some people on one side making a little noise, heavy music and so forth. So I don't think I want to call it a meeting. I think a special ceremony. I, I will take that. But I am very happy to be here and represent St. Lucia Air and Seaports Authority as we embark on behalf of the government of St. Lucia in a once-in-a-lifetime transformational project. And I say so because... I am not being cheap with my words, or I'm not being flamboyant by any stretch of the imagination. Because 175 million US dollars is not chump change. But what 175 million US dollars in the Uranora International Airport Redevelopment Project seeks to do is to increase all that is good in St. Lucia by means of trade, by means of access, by means of tourism, by means of conforming to international standards and putting our footprint on the world map. We have done so with our Nobel laureates. We are continuing to do so in sport and music. But this project seeks to transform the length and breadth of St. Lucia. So you ask yourself, why should the government of St. Lucia embark upon this project? And it's interesting that we're talking to the diaspora because uh, as you come in and out on your usual visits, sometimes it's, it breaks your heart. You're happy to be home, but you're at an airport facility where if it rains, you will know. If it is too hot, when you've come from minus degree conditions, you will feel it. And then there's the weight. The weight to be processed, the weight to get your luggage and all of that. The fact that family can't park and have to make several rounds to pick you up and so forth. I do not want anyone to leave this evening thinking that the airport redevelopment project is a project confined to tourism. But it is a project about us. We use that facility. Our families use it. The friends we invite use it. And so it is important and it speaks about each and every single one of us. At SLASPA we say that the HIA redevelopment project is improving our hello to the world. And our staff of 450 strong stand by this project. And we thank the government of St. Lucia for placing faith in SLASPA for executing this project, just as we have done several other projects. 
But let's get to the facts. Uranora has to improve. It has to improve because we have been using this facility since 1941. Everybody knows the math. So yes, I was saying, and the captain approves it, that SLASPA has successfully managed several projects, including the, the reconstruction of our berths, the Breasting Dolphin project, continuous upgrades to Uranora International Airport, up till the last major upgrade, which was many years ago, some 1991. So, this project seeks to encompass three major areas. The air side, the terminal, and road access and traffic management systems. This is a 30-year master plan which seeks to provide a state-of-the-art airport facility that will serve as a modern gateway, thus enhancing the passenger journey while at the same time meet international aviation protocols and standards. With an extensive collection of up-to-date services, Uranora International Airport will meet the needs of St. Lucian's, St. Lucia's tourism industry, and will underpin the broader national macroeconomic development goals. And I know if our full complement of cabinet of ministers were here, maybe we would hear them knocking something. Because we're saying that this project is going to open up several aspects. And having the diaspora present you yourself can add value to such a project because an airport is just a facility. But several things go into that. The airport facility with the architecture inspired by our very own calabash, our national tree, the terminal building will feature efficient check-in, passport control, and security while offering a level of comfort in a customer-friendly and aesthetically pleasing environment. Upon completion, the new airport facility, the road infrastructure and traffic management system will be upgraded to complement the revamped ground transportation systems, thereby easing access. Ultimately, and this is important, our new HIA will suit the present and ever-growing demand of our people, trade, and tourism industry. So we said that the project is being undertaken by SLASPA on behalf of the government of St. Lucia and our architects CBR Ihiri are well known for their experience in designing airports. Our contractors are the Overseas Engineering and Construction Company, which is a Taiwanese-based firm with many years of experience in actual airport construction. If you want to see their work in the region, all you have to do is visit Argyle International Airport in St. Vincent, which they recently completed sometime last year. And that airport has been commissioned, and so we can get a serious feel for their work. I am through with that part of my presentation. But I would like to say here that we at SLASPA are very excited for this project. We are excited for the fact that it is going to complement where we as St. Lucia want to see ourselves. It is about everyone. It is about the diaspora. It is about our young people. It is about improving business. It is about offering us as a nation more opportunities to expand our horizons. We ask you for further information to keep in touch with us and feel free to give us your comments. You are free to link with us 
at www.slaspa.com and you can click the link for the HIA project where we'll be giving you continuous updates with regards to that. At this point, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and just take a listen from the eyes of children what the HIA redevelopment project seeks to do. I thank you. Mommy says that we in St. Lucia are building a new international airport in Viewfort. It will be the best in the entire Caribbean. I like going to the airport. I love the sounds of the airplanes landing and taking off. Our new airport will be two stories. The top is departures and below arrivals. It is more than 337,000 square feet. It will be three times the size of the airport we have now. Wow, now that's a lot of space. You can come up to the airport on a new ramp that will put you on the top floor in the departure area. Before going into the check-in area, there is an open space called the curbside. From the curbside, you enter spaces with glass all around. It's bright and fresh. The arches of the building are inspired by the branches of our national tree, the calabash. Right, Mummy? There are many check-in counters with the latest technology so that you can check and drop off your bags fast and easy. Thank goodness! Finally, no more long lines. The new Uranor International Airport is decorated with beautiful St. Lucian art and has lots of trees. It's like a forest in an airport. Hmm. In the security area, there are machines with the latest screen technology that meet international standards. Our airport is going to be very safe. We will have six scanning machines to process persons allowing them to go through quickly. Before we get onto the plane, you can enjoy the food at a signature restaurant overlooking the Pitos. There are duty-free shopping and lots of seating area at the boarding gates. Now you can board the aircraft using the convenient air-conditioned jet bridge. Our new Uranora International Airport will include improvements to the airside, terminal building and road network systems. When the plane parks on the new Arpon, you will access the terminal through the jet bridges. In the terminal, you will go down to arrivals and through customs and immigration using stairs, escalator or the elevator. The washrooms will be right around the corner for that quick dash. At immigration, there are more technologies to help with border control. For the small flow of people, there is increased space. A new feature of the new airport will be duty-free shopping upon arrival. It's now time for your bags. The baggage area will feature four carousels. You can get your bags quickly and spend more time enjoying more of the island. The new fully air-conditioned waiting area has so much room for families and friends to hug and say hello. Even taxis can meet their guests in the same area. You can choose to sit in one of the comfortable lounges or refresh yourself with one of the local beverages. From there, 
you can take your taxi or ground transportation. Our new airport will have a 30-year lifespan and will offer an excellent customer experience. It will provide opportunities for many solutions for generations to come. Who knows, maybe one day I will work at our new international airport and say a St. Lucian hello to the world. At this point in time, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite to address you her her Excellency Dr. Joycelyn Fletcher, who is the ambassador in the office of the Prime Minister for Diaspora Affairs. Please give her a warm welcome. Many people have said, what is this diaspora thing? People have not heard, they do not know what diaspora is all about and have been wandering and wandering and wandering. So now we're going to tell you and give you a history of diaspora. It's a new and it's an old thing. The diaspora initiative, when they say now that it's a new initiative, it's only new because it is implemented now. But the diaspora journey began in 2008 under the Stevenson King administration. Dr. June Suma, who was the then um, uh, um, she was the ambassador for CARICOM and OECS with responsibility for diaspora. You would understand that, of course, a lot of attention was not paid to the diaspora because it was a, like a stepchild or maybe an adopted child or maybe just a foster child. But um, they did good work in beginning to meet with the diaspora, engage with the associations, meet with the Union of St. Lucia Overseas Association, USLOA, which you'll be hearing a lot about. And because of that, they decided, look, by listening to the diaspora, understanding the concerns of the diaspora, the diaspora saying that we are not just out there and we're not just not doing anything. They're remittances. We are giving back more than just remittances. We own lands, we build houses. Some of us have businesses in St. Lucia, although we live overseas. Some of us are carrying trading going on. You need to listen to us, to the serious contributions that we are making to this country. And the government listened. However, they demitted office and the Kenya Antony government came in. The best thing about St. Lucia, and that is why Little Island is nothing. We are powerful people. That's why we have two Nobel laureates. And I go out there in the Caribbean, and I'm so proud of what St. Lucia has done. The Kenny Anthony government approved the diaspora policy, which says that the diaspora initiative has political support from both political parties. So we have political will when it comes to the diaspora initiative. And that alone has given us strength because diaspora is about people who love St. Lucia, who wants to give back, who wants to invest, who wants to come back. It is not about race or religion. It's not about political color or political party. It's about St. Lucia. And so they supported and passed the, the diaspora policy. However, when the Allen, they demitted office and the Allen Chastney government came in and this government decided, well, you, look, it started, it's approved. Let us do the thing now. Let's take it to the next step. We are going to implement. And in implementing, in 20, January 2018, I was called by the Prime Minister and asked, Would you, are you interested? I heard that you were having a lot of conversation with Dr. Suma, because I had brought Dr. Suma, Ambassador Laura, um, the immediate past Director of Statistics, and Ambassador um, Dr. Edward Green, who is now the new vice chancellor in Guyana, who was my, my, my boss in CARICOM. They had come to Guyana, um, to, to Monstrat, where I was working at the time, on an initiative that I had to deal with diaspora. So when he called, I said to him, give me a year to finish and I will come. Because I love the diaspora initiative and I want to give to it. But I need to finish my contract and here I am. This is how this diaspora 
business began. So the office was set up in the office of the Prime Minister. All was set in the diaspora policy. It determined who or what the ambassador should be, who the ambassador reports to, where the office should be placed. And this is in the diaspora policy, which was an initiative between the Union of St. Lucia Overseas Association and the government, governments of St. Lucia. So here I am. The Prime Minister and his cabinet kept good faith. They wanted the diaspora to know you matter. They wanted you to know that your contributions are important. And therefore, we are going to put everything into it. We're going to give the ambassador latitude to run with this and work with you, meet with you, engage with you, find out what you need. Only you, not CARICOM, not OECS, not any other job, just ambassador for diaspora only. So I am your servant 110%. SLIA loved it. The resource team loved it. And they came on board. And we have been reaching out to the diaspora. Now, it's not only going and visit them and say, well, here we go, talk, 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 talk. They're not interested in just talk. They want to see that you're putting your money where your mouth is. They want to see policies. They want to see initiative. And of course, what have we done? As soon as I got into office, I began to try to know the diaspora. So I did research for seven months on the diaspora associations, find out where they were, find out their history. And then I began to build a database in my office, and the office is made up of two of us. We began to build this database of the existing associations. We collected information from the consulates, we searched Facebook for solutions, contacted solutions in the diaspora and LinkedIn and other social media. Then we had contact persons, you know, who were members. Like I have nine of my siblings in the diaspora in the United Kingdom and the United States. And so we asked people that we know. I have cousins, relatives, and so on. And we said, tell them what's happening and have them send us their, their email at contact. And this is how we built the database. The diaspora database is built up of associations, groups, and individuals. And now I can't give you an exact figure right now. It's not in my head. I'm too young to remember all those figures. But the diaspora database have blown itself way over into thousands of persons right now living in the diaspora. Know this that the diaspora is bigger than the population of St. Lucia over and over and over again. Then, what, then after this research and putting this database together, we had tremendous assistance from what I call my diaspora volunteer staff, and that is the SLIA, especially a lady named Bernie. Bernie happens to be the secretary, and I don't care if she's giving me all kinds of eyes up here. Bernie is the secretary of SLIA, as well as the secretary of the Union of St. Lucia Overseas Association. I couldn't believe my good luck. So, of course, I never let Bernie rest. And then I went to the association, I called them, I dealt with them, met with them, and they gave me and helped me and helped me build my database also to disseminate information to the to the diaspora we put a pack together and we call it the diaspora entry pack this pack tells you what the what what policies the government of St. Lucia have in place for the diaspora what policies as far as customs is concerned invest St. Lucia is concerned Expo St. Lucia is concerned what is happening in, 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 on the legal aspect what the office is doing and what we are, what the Union of St. Lucia Association and what St. Lucia International Association is doing, we put that in a pack. And one little staff member would sit every day and send that to every single diaspora in our database. And as we keep adding to that database, continue to send information daily until the diaspora who are saying they don't get any information they ignored, nobody thinks them. 
Now, they are inundated with data. If there are jobs in St. Lucia, if there are consultancies, what's happening, what the government is doing, they get that every single day. And as soon as you join the date, you have a new name. She calls them once she has a contact number, speaks with them. And then she puts me on to speak with them. Good Lord, the number of telephone calls. Apart from sending the, 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 the diaspora information and about the investment opportunities and all of that I've told you in St. Lucia, we also tell them about this SSDF initiative. What SSDF has done is that they've signed an MOU with the Union of St. Lucia Overseas Association to open in St. Lucia a thrift shop and that the diaspora can send things to that shop to be sold cheaply and the money can be used to do things in the, in, in the society. But apart from that, you know, diaspora like to send barrels and um, ambulances and blood banks and all kinds of things for the, the, the hospitals and the schools. All they have to do is let us know. And all the documents go to this gentleman here and he takes care of it right down to delivery. Now tell me, I mean, you know, what you're asking for again? These people have done this. Don't let nobody tell you anything. This is a reality, he's sitting here. I cannot lie about him. You know, and before I get an email from a diaspora, and I, I copy the response to the diaspora, I copy him on it. So I always know whether he responds or whether any of my team member responds. When anybody writes to me about anything, whether it's land, whether it's problems with banks, or they want to invest, I put the right diaspora team on member, copy, and then within no joke, less than 24 hours, I have the emails here, people, and I can give them to you and show it to you. They respond. They respond to the diaspora. Quick time. No diaspora cannot say, I don't know what's going on. And nobody answers me. I have to go round and round and round. That is what that team do. But we are the in-between. We channel it to the right place for you. So once you think we work, because we work 24-7, I get calls on my bed at 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning because of time zones from diaspora. And I respond because my details are out there in the diaspora. So they can call any of us and they will drag. Anyway, I'm coming back to that because I cannot go ahead of myself. We also ask all the groups and the associations and the individuals to submit their names and persons in the diaspora who have made significant contributions in the country where they are based. And those persons will be, will be recognized with various awards. The Prime Minister's Award, the Governor's Award, the This Award, the Diaspora Award, and this will be done in February. The Diaspora have responded and they have sent us the names, the nominations. We have something like 35 nominations, I think, Janique, of persons who have done significant contribution in the Diaspora. And that's not just persons from associations and old persons who just do law wars and independence. No, and they're very important because they contribute to keeping our culture alive in the diaspora and the tourism, but also the youth in sports and education because we gave them the criteria. And these nominations came in and we will be recognizing the diaspora. Everybody will be recognized, some with certificates and some with the trophies based on the criteria that was sent. There is also a youth, um, a youth um, award. Now, just recently, Minister Bellrose, one of the champions of the diaspora unit, she um, called us and she said, do you have a, 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 a nominations? persons in the diaspora who are doing significant, she started to give me, she was, and she called out two names to me, I tell her, Minister, I have more than that. I have the bios and we can send it to you. And in quick time, Miss Meyer sent that pack to the minister, even if I was going on travel duty. And the minister sent me a WhatsApp and she said, boy, you're something else. And that's what we, we are doing. So we are telling you now what we, this office is doing. 
We have, in the latter half of this year, we have paid particular attention to the diaspora youth groups. So we have liaised with universities and, and other vehicles where there are some strong youth groups almost in every country. And right now, this office have youth groups in the diaspora in almost every country who are involved with us, and some of them have written to us and we sent it on to the Prime Minister. They want to come down St. Lucia to make a presentation to the Prime Minister. There was the group in Canada that was waiting for the Prime Minister to come up and address them. Unfortunately, we had to postpone that, meet, that, that meeting, but the Prime Minister's promise will happen. And of course, we have our diaspora return youth here. And Leslie liked to say I'm not the chair, you know, but then you, you brought that group together. And youth came to me, so I have to call you the chair. But that is just to show you that the youth now, getting the information, they are involved with the diaspora office. We have partnered with the Government Information Service, where whenever we have presidents, leaders of those groups or associations, they come in. I must say, Ms. Davina Lee, who heads that unit, is fantastic. I mean, every time we call and we say to her, Miss Lee, we have a president here, we have a leader here, we have a group, a um, youth group here, she puts them on issues and answers where they ha have an interview and they can speak about what they're doing, what their association, what their group is doing. And those videos, they send it to us and we put it on our and we send it out, disseminate it to all our diaspora. You do not want to know the feedback that we have had just because of what Miss Lee and her team has been doing. Kudos to you, GIS. Thank you very much. You deserve a round of applause. Now, not only do the Diaspora receive that. We also send it to the consulate. So if we miss anybody, the consulates can send out what GIS is doing. Okay? And that has tripled our interest since this part, um, interest in the diaspora since this partnership. We have partnered, of course, I told you about what is happening with SSDF. And I know for sure that St. Croix has been the last group to come after you partnering. And we have a big diaspora group in St. Croix. The Minister Flood and myself just recently went to visit them. And that group, we have two groups, and they're very vibrant in St. Croix. And they have already worked on this MOU and gone over to for support with SSDF. I told you about the resource team, and I said I would tell you a little more of them, and they are made up of senior executives of those various organizations that directly impact the, the diaspora. And I tell you, we owe them a debt of gratitude. I mean, who would believe that those executives, all I did is call them up, speak to them, and said, so I sell to them what we were doing, and what the diaspora was asking for, and what I needed. And I mean, I could not believe it. I mean, I know they say I talk and I can talk a bird to go and swim, but they came on board and they met with us in the meeting in the Prime Minister's office. We had a very long meeting and they are meeting on the 29th. I know it's the next meeting with the diaspora representatives. So this team don't only meet with me in my office to sit down and talk and to talk together and decide what policies that we can come up with that affects the diaspora based on the concerns of the diaspora, but they listen to the diaspora themselves quarterly over Zoom with all those hundreds of diaspora representatives. They listen to them via Zoom. We have this meeting. The 29th is the next meeting in the morning on a Friday in the office of the Prime Minister. The diaspora, will be, the, the diaspora team will be answering questions directly from the diaspora representatives. This will be an ongoing thing. Now tell me, and I hope that they never ask me for, to tell the Prime Minister that they'd like a stipend because they've been doing this with just coffee, tea, and sandwiches. I hope they continue with nothing but the love that they have for St. Lucia and their desire to see that St. Lucia um, becomes better with the assistance of our diaspora. We all know that the donor, com the donor countries, donor assistance is diminishing. 
our diaspora, which is bigger than the population of St. Lucia by three or four times, and that is first, second, and third generation diaspora. And I'll tell you a little about the second and third diaspora. They are even more St. Lucian than we here in St. Lucia. I mean, I had to go in there and see that kind of thing, and it blew my mind. So I just wanted to tell you that how much that diaspora team is doing, that no longer can diaspora say, nobody's answering me, there's nothing going on, nobody's giving me anything, nobody's answering me, I don't know where to invest. Leslie, listen up, I don't know who to go to. The banks invest in Lucia, they have young people like you who are willing to sit with you, listen, encourage you, and help you. Expos in Lucia have the same thing. You go to these people and talk to them and they will tell you what they will Just tell me you want to talk to them and I send it to them, and they respond, and they have been responding to many people. We are no longer in the age where there is no information. You have an office that responds in quick time. You have a team. You have SLIA. You have USLOA. You have all that information given to you. There is no reason that you can say, I don't know where to go, or say that I don't know what the government is doing for the diaspora. We have partnered with the government central statistical department, and I don't know if Mr. Matre is here, but he said he would have been. And uh, Mr. Matre and his office have joined and partnered with our office to, you see, we started with Mr. St. Catherine, but Mr. Matre also bought in and has been working with us and sending his staff to tailor the data collection that it targets the diaspora. Without data, data drives policy. And we need data. Data on the size of our diaspora. I only got this information from, I get information now from ILO and from IMF and from IOM, International of, um, Office of Migration. But with our own central statistical office targeting our diaspora for us, we get the information that we need that we can give to our policymakers as it relates to our diaspora, also to give to our diaspora offices. This is what the Central Statistical Department is doing right now for this office. We know for a fact on that, um, what, what is happening. We know where our diaspora is located. We don't have all the diaspora because there are many undocumented diaspora. So what we have done, is asked to put in the database that the diaspora only ask, we only ask them for their first name. So, Jocelyn, I live in New York, and this is my email address if I want to do that. If I don't want to put my email address on the database, I will contact the Office of Diaspora Affairs just to make sure that when I can trust them and know that my information will not be sent to the immigration in the United States, then I put my name in the database. This is only for population, okay? We are now, um, and, and as I said, this database that we have spoken to people about, we're trying to create, where diaspora can log in their, 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 their CVs and they can get information concerning what's happening in there. They can put on information about their business. They can um, get in, put on things about their social activities, deaths, births, anything that concerns the diaspora can be in that diaspora database and everybody in the diaspora can see it. Everybody in St. Lucia, they can target diaspora, say, look, I would like this person, I like their, their CV, are you willing to come down to St. Lucia for two years for contract or complete, come back and just stay? You have that opportunity and this is what we have in the database. On the database, you see all what is the government of St. Lucia is doing and it is done by constituency. So all what's happening in the different constituency groups, it's, it will be in that database so the diaspora sees it. Right now we're doing it manually. My office is sending it to the diaspora manually. Ask them, they're here, even if they're in St. Lucia and they're on our database, we send the information to them manually. And they can tell you right now here that they get it every day from us as soon as the government drop it, we send it to them. So the diaspora cannot say they don't know what is happening for them or what is happening in St. Lucia. The opportunity that this diaspora wanted 
return diaspora wanted, just like the others get, is to be able to ask questions, to be able to target and ask. It's not only having all this information, but they cannot ask questions like the others have been having, to be able to ask me questions or the prime minister or the minister about what they have. The diaspora office also works, as I said, very long hours, 24 hours, seven days a week we work because of the geographic location of the diaspora and the time zones. So because of that, we meet with the executive of the Union of St. Lucia Overseas Association. I meet with them monthly via Zoom. I meet with the representatives, and that's the hundreds of representatives. The president will send out the link. He and Bernie will send out the link to them, and Bernie's here. She can tell you about that. And they come on board, and I think just about how many Saturdays ago, about three Saturdays ago, we had a meeting, and we speak with them. And then Saturdays, those people want to have their meetings with me like I don't have a life. And so we speak with them about everything concerning them via Zoom. I love my diaspora, so I'll do anything for them. So don't worry if I give them stick. Okay? So the, even the president, who's Mr. Roska Das, he comes down to St. Lucia very often to meet with the prime minister and myself so that he can get information and present to his diaspora representatives and his executive. Again, I said to you, we work closely with the St. Lucia International Association and for their assistance, what they're doing, and the fact that they're here to assist anybody who wants to return to St. Lucia, thinking of returning, contact our office, or the information we have for you on the St. Lucia International Association. I have not heard anybody being let down when they contacted them. They are a tremendous supportive group. We also send periodic reports on the diaspora office activities to the Prime Minister, the Minister of External Affairs, who is very, very involved in what's happening. She wants to know, she always calls. She and Minister Bellrose, but we don't send Minister Bellrose any um, the reports, but Minister Bellrose goes about and she pulls her diaspora and she calls our office frequently when it comes to her diaspora, just like the Minister of External Affairs was very supportive. The Cabinet Secretary also gets our report. So every time I come from a diaspora um, town hall meeting overseas, I write a report and I send it to the Cabinet Secretary, copy to the, to the Prime Minister, copy to the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister of External Affairs. So then they are up to date with what is happening in the diaspora. To date, I have gone to visit six countries. I can't do all of it in just one year. I've only been here one year. And um, we will do the less, but we did the major and bigger associations. Cayenne was our last, which is a tremendous population. They are asking for the ministers to come up to uh, meet with them. From that one meeting, we found about invest. You're going to smile because we got about seven investors. So you're going to smile. They're coming down for you. The first is in December on the 27th. So you're going to smile. I've been giving you trickling 1111 here. The banks, they're coming to you as well. So look out, Expo. Any new initiative being implemented takes unrelenting focus. It takes determination. It takes sacrifice and commitment. I believe in it, I enjoy doing it, I wanted to do it. I am one of them, I was in the diaspora for a number of years. My sons, I see them here, young men, they were, they don't know St. Lucia, but they kept come visiting, they were returning diaspora, and they are the ones who really decided, mommy, you're coming back, so I'm here. And um, I know the needs of the diaspora, I, I understand it, I was one of them, and I am pleased to see that hard work has reaped, or rather is beginning to reap the rewards. Miss Myers, who's my assistant, Janique Myers, her name is now as Colgate in people's house. That's how well known she is in the diaspora. She calls them, everybody, so whenever I go out there, they say, you didn't bring Miss Myers with you? I want to see Miss Myers, they come to St. Lucia, and boy, do they come. And when they come, they ask the front desk for Miss Myers. They all want to know who's this Miss Myers who keeps calling them all the time. The diaspora office, my dears, are made of two persons with this extended team. Without them, just two of us could never have done what we have achieved with the diaspora today. It was time that we told St. Lucia 
and you, you the returning um, St. Lucians, you know what the Diaspora Office have been doing. You've been working with us. But we wanted St. Lucia to know this is where we are. This is what is happening. These are the hardworking people who give to the diaspora. The diaspora matters. They can change and shift the social and economic fabric of this country. We need to embrace them and understand the contribution that they're making, which is more than just remittances. It is the houses they have. And look at those beating houses you see around the place and you see them empty. The diaspora built them. And when they built them, they used the people in St. Lucia. They bought the materials in St. Lucia. So they have been shifting. Some of them have opened housing developments and they have businesses and they're not here. But they are doing, and it's about time, we in St. Lucia as a whole embrace our diaspora to help us. Show them that they matter. Just like the diaspora group has done, just like SLIA, who themselves are returning diaspora. It is time we in St. Lucia open up, embrace our diaspora. The government of St. Lucia have shown to the diaspora that you matter because here I am, here is my office, here is what's happening. It is because the government says you matter and we recognize and we welcome and you value your contribution. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everybody got a little a little booklet that was given to you upon entrance here this evening and it is called building a new st lucia does everyone have a copy did you take a copy it is a very informative booklet and it speaks to the journey of building a new st lucia from 2016 into some of the projects that the government of St. Lucia has embarked in building a new St. Lucia. And I'm certainly sure that persons who left St. Lucia a few years ago, maybe about five, ten years ago, and who came back maybe sometime this year, you would see that there is definitely a lot happening in St. Lucia. You can see that St. Lucia is changing, and changing for the better, I might add, one of the changes that you can see perhaps as you enter into the city um, on a morning is our market vendors who are all along um, Jeremy Street. And I come up to Castries, I'm from Viewfort, so I come up to Castries very early in the morning. And I can tell you at 5.30, 6 o'clock, it is an amazing sight to enter into the city and to see all the vendors with all the fruits and vegetables along the street. It's, it's just really beautiful. But one of the reasons that they are there is that the government of St. Lucia has undertaken a market redevelopment project. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome the acting prime minister, Honorable Guy Joseph, as he makes his way up to the podium. As I was saying, we are making life comfortable for everyone in St. Lucia, and that is also inclusive of our market vendors. So we have begun, and I think the project is complete, um, the market redevelopment project, and so very soon our vendors will be returning to a refurbished market. New spaces being created, tiles, new toilet facilities. It is wider and it, is, it makes it more comfortable not only for the vendors, but for us St. Lucians as we go into the market and to do our shopping. So this is one of the projects of building a new St. Lucia. On the education, the government of St. Lucia, I'm pleased to announce in the last at least two financial years, we have spent $10 million each year on the refurbishment of our various secondary and primary schools in St. Lucia. Most of the schools were in a dilapidated conditions after years and years of neglect, and they still have a long way to go because I'm sure you would have heard of some of the concerns of some of the schools that is still not corrected, but it is part of the ongoing project of the refurbishment of our schools in St. Lucia. And the Ministry of Education is also pleased to announce 
that starting in January of next year, they will be embarking on an IT program where students of Form 3 will be given tablets, and on those tablets, there will be a download of all the textbooks that they will be using for their classrooms, which is an interactive text. So this is something that will be introduced to Form 3 students in January of this year. On our healthcare, I'm sure you've heard a lot about healthcare. And those of you who've probably lived abroad can share your experiences. It is a challenge everywhere you go around the world. Healthcare is certainly a challenge, the cost of healthcare and access to quality, affordable healthcare as well. But the government of St. Lucia is committed to ensuring that there is access to quality, affordable healthcare. And so in that regard, we are pleased to let you know that construction continues on the new wing of the St. Jude's Hospital in the south. And it is anticipated that we will be opening that hospital as soon as possible. But I also want to let you know that in spite of the fact that the construction is ongoing, the government of St. Lucia has spent millions of dollars in renovation works and making it as comfortable as possible at the George Odlum Stadium where the hospital currently is being housed. They've spent money on the sewage system, they spent money on electricals, on air conditioning, and just trying, I think we've purchased a new x-ray machine as well, just trying to make life a bit more comfortable for the doctors, nurses, and patients who are housed in the South. We continuing our progression to um, the OKEU hospital, the transitioning from the Victoria Hospital. We've had a few um, various aspects of the hospital, which is currently at OKEU, and that progress continues in anticipation that at least by mid next year, we will have a full transition from Victoria Hospital to the ON OKEU Hospital. On the infrastructure, we're our flagship projects, of course, we spoke about the Hiranora International Redevelopment Project. And I'm also pleased to announce that the government, some of you would have seen it, has started spending, we're spending over 40 million US dollars on road rehabilitation projects throughout the island. We've started construction of roads in Swazel Sultibus. We've started a few roads in the Grosley area, and we will continue to construct and rehabilitate roads throughout the island, including Ancillary, Canaries, Castry South, in the Viewfort area. So commuters can soon get a little bit of a relief as we continue to construct and to rehabilitate roads in and around St. Lucia. On the tourism, I'm pleased to announce that our tourism numbers continues to grow month by month, week by week. Visitors continue to find St. Lucia attractive, the place to visit, the place to spend time, and the place to spend their money. Our cruise ship um, sector continues to grow. I'm also pleased to announce that we are working with Carnival Cruise Line and MSC in trying to construct a cruise port for home porting in the south of St. Lucia. I think um, a lot of us think that Castries is a little bit saturated with all the cruise ships coming up to Castries. So it's time people like myself who are in the south get an opportunity to experience the tourists arriving in the south, arriving in Viewfort, and perhaps taking the route down to Sufre. Everything is not concentrated or shouldn't be concentrated in the city. And so I'm pleased to know that the government is working. We've signed an MOU with those um, cruise ship lines, and we're hoping that very soon we can confirm that we will be constructing those cruise ports in the south. On the agriculture, we have started our project of trying to be self-sufficient in at least six crops. We believe that if we concentrate on some of these major crops and our farmers, we can be self-sufficient in those areas, and that will create more employment um, for our farmers, and it will also ensure that as St. Lucians, we continue to eat fresh fruits and vegetables daily instead of some of the imported fresh fruits and vegetables that we are getting. So that project is on the way with assistance from the Taiwanese government. And also we continue to increase our banana production and looking for ways to ensure that we can export as much of the bananas that we produce as possible. Under justice and security, we continue to make our country safe. 
we have instituted our CCTV cameras um, quite a few places on the island, and I know we are currently negotiating for more CCTV cameras. The Commissioner of Police is here, um, so I feel very safe, Commissioner, that you are here. Um, we have made available to the police new bikes and new vehicles in trying to assist them. Um, I know we've also added at least more than 40 new um, special constable to help patrol the streets of, of St. Lucia in trying to make it safe and as safe as possible. What we would like to encourage St. Lucians who are here and who are also listening to me, that we need to play our part. If it's one thing I hear the police continue to cry out for is for St. Lucians and us to continue to support the police when we see crimes being committed, report it, and let us play our part in being vigilant and ensuring that we do all that is within our power to secure our homes and our facilities and not leave everything up to the police as well. So we need to play our part. It's a collaboration between us and the police and we need to work together. In terms of sports, we have begun construction of our sporting facilities to expand and to ensure that our young people have as much playground and playing facilities as possible throughout the island. I'm pleased to report that the facility in Sufre, we are building a mini stadium with a track around it, and construction has also begun on the cricket grounds as well in Sufre. And so a lot of the sporting activities will not, uh, the regional and international, will not be concentrated only up in Boseju, but we're hoping that we can now have some of that happening in Sufre. And when we begin in the south, you can have some of those activities happening in the south as well. But these are some of the works that is being executed by the government of St. Lucia in ensuring that we continue to build and to develop St. Lucia to the best of our ability. So ladies and gentlemen, I think you need to give the government of St. Lucia a resounding round of applause for their continued hard work as they continue to build a new St. Lucia. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I know you probably did not anticipate to be here too long. So without any further ado, I would like to welcome the Acting Prime Minister, Honorable Guy Joseph, as he addresses you. And after, afterwards, we have the microphone set up. You will be, we will be opening the floor for any questions or clarifications that you may have to either Ambassador Fletcher or Minister Joseph. Thank you very much, and let's welcome Honorable Guy Joseph. Thank you very much. A very pleasant good evening to everyone. Uh, my apologies for joining you so late for the meeting. But as you know, today is my church day, so I'm coming straight from church to this meeting here tonight. I am here because I think it is important that we understand where we need to go as a country. And more so, that there be some appreciation of where St. Lucia is today. Because for some reason, there is the perception that we give as politicians that when we come into office by some wave of a magic wand that you can fix everything in a country. But we know that it does not work like that. While there are plans, there are programs, there's a manifesto that outlines the vision of a government for a country. You never really know the true state of the country until you begin to handle the affairs and see what you have inherited. I know that as a government, we have not done a good job in explaining to people what we inherited as a government. Nevertheless, we did not want to come across as looking for excuses for what needed to be done. But let's look at some very basic things that needs to happen. The country's debt to GDP ratio, what is set by the international community, is the prudential limit 
is supposed to be 60%. And if that means 60 cents out of every dollar you earn to cover the debt and the other 40 cents to run the affairs of the day-to-day -day runnings of a country. What we see today is a debt that is accumulating while we, the debt is accumulating at a faster rate or our expenditure is accumulating much faster than the revenue or the income of the country. And anybody who runs a business in St. Lucia would understand that this is a recipe that leads to bankruptcy or closure of a business. A country is no different. And we can take example from our sister island in Barbados and what has happened. When you run a debt to GDP ratio of over 120%. Now, as St. Lucians, when this government came into office, one of the things we said is that we must double the GDP of this country. The output of St. Lucia is too low. We are not producing as much as we ought to. Our level of productivity is beyond what we are able to do up our potential. So if we continue to grow this economy at 1, 2, and 3%, it means that we will always run a deficit government. You will always be borrowing to meet your day-to-day -day operational costs. Eventually, that's untenable. You cannot sustain that situation indefinitely. The ECCB has indicated it, so it's not just our declaration as a government that less than 5 and 6% growth in the economy. In other words, if we have 5 to 6% growth, we would just be staying afloat, just with our nose above water being able to breathe. Nobody wants to live like that. That means that the country would be living hand to mouth. And the moment one thing goes wrong, you go under. That is the reality of what we have inherited. So when the prime minister comes and the prime minister says, we need to do things differently because our formulas have not been working. What we are doing in the past is not bringing us the desired results that we are looking for. So there must be a new approach towards development. There must be an approach that is going to put St. Lucia on par with remaining sustainable. Every day we cannot be going to other countries, cap in hand, begging to bail us out of the situations that we are in. After 40 years of independence, what is expected of us as a nation? What is the level of productivity that we would expect? And we have the challenges every day. Our people have shown that they have the capacity, but the linkages between the public sector and the private sector, we are not on par. So the private sector is moving in one direction while the public sector is lagging behind. That's the reality. Most of us don't want to go to government offices to transact any business. Because the quality of service and output you get there is not commensurate with what is expected of the output of the country. And so when we say we are going to hold everybody accountable, 
people think that we are criticizing persons. But you see, as long as St. Lucia remains a country that will blame the 17 elected politicians for our state, then we are going to continue to suffer the consequences. The government debt or wage bill is in the region of $450 million a year. So let's put that in perspective. If a country of 170,000 people would be spending a wage bill, and don't misunderstand me, we are not overpaying anybody in this country. I think more people are underpaid than people are overpaid. Our police officers, with what they have to put on the line, I think they are underpaid. Our nurses, our firemen, who did such a wonderful job right next to the city hall with the recent fire that we had there. When we look at the challenges that we are faced with, we are not saying that we are overpaying, but what we are saying is if we are spending that amount of money, we expect a certain output. How do we measure what is happening in government? What are the benchmarks that we use to make a determination? So if there's a pothole on a road that should have been addressed, who do we criticize? The Minister of Infrastructure. Are there not engineers? <clears throat> Are there not technicians? Are there not supervisors? Who are we going to hold responsible when if you blame just the politicians, whether it be this government or the other government or any government, what would happen is that if they don't like you or they don't support your government and they know it's you going to take the blame, even if they have the capacity and the means to do the work, they would delay in doing it because after all, a politician will get blamed for it. That is why the approach of this government is saying, look here, everybody must measure up to what is required. How are we going to grow this economy? What is it that is required of us in order to be successful as a country? Every approach taken by this government is met with a lot of opposition. And I'm not talking about opposition from the opposition parliamentarians, because that's their job. Our, de our democratic system pays them to do that, to oppose. But the reality is, let me give you some examples. When we came into government, there were two dolphin parks approved by the previous government. Nobody said anything. As soon as this government said, we are going to establish a dolphin park, all hell broke loose. Now, if you don't want me to speak the truth to you, I don't know any other way to do it. So I have to tell it to you as it is. The lands in Mikud, where the hotel was supposed to go on, had been there, sold more than 30 years ago for that purpose. We never heard there had any artifacts, anything that was necessitating any intervention by any group. All of a sudden, new buyers come in, bought the property, put their drawings, ready to start their construction. They are told you cannot proceed with construction because that is what is happening. But at the same time, the country must strike the right balance between development and sustainability of the environment. What is our situation today? Global warming. In the last 20 years, we've had at least four one in a hundred year storm. I don't know. Let me break that down so you understand. There are certain weather events 
that would, science says that would happen once in a hundred years. In the last 20 years, we've had about three or four of them, which means that global warming is real, contrary to what some people may want to say, that global warming is not real. We have to build for resilience. That is a requirement. You cannot continue to build in the same manner. So in building for resilience, a building that would cost $20,000 may now cost you $35,000 just to be able to meet the basic benchmarks to build for resilience. While this building costs you more, it does not result in a greater level of productivity or neither does it allow you more space to maneuver. So what does that mean? Our cost of doing business is going up. So this government came in and made some deliberate attempts when we said five to stay alive, what did we mean? We didn't mean that the five decisions that we took would fix the economy and, and have St. Lucia flowing with milk and honey. That, that, that's not the promised land yet. But we are working towards that. And so we knew that you needed to do some basic things to bring some measure of relief to the country. And I can say this without fear of criticism. We got a hard time from the IMF and the World Bank to reduce taxes in St. Louis. They gave us a very, very tough time. But I can tell you, as we speak now, St. Lucia is applauded by the same agencies because the decisions made by the government has borne fruit. And when the IMF report comes on St. Lucia, you will be able to judge for yourself. So, where did we end up? We said, there are so many people who cannot go to the hospital even when they are sick because they are owing a bill. So what the government did was there was $14 million worth of money owed to the Victoria Hospital and St. Jude. The government wrote off that amount because we subsidize the hospital. Then there was an increase in the registration fees for vehicles. We reduced that increase by 50%, not the overall cost. And we've been explaining that, but people choose to say it otherwise. The amount that it was increased by was reduced by 50%. That was to bring relief. When we saw the number of children who could not make it to school because their parents could not find five or ten dollars every day for them to go to school. And you would recall that it was this government that reintroduced the school transport system when we came back into government in 2006 because it had been stopped previously. What was the intention? The intention was to see that as many kids make it to school as possible. So we increased that. Then going to school, getting to school is one thing, but when a parent does not have enough to give a child a bread on a morning to eat, and that child goes to school on a hungry belly, their ability to focus and function effectively is impaired. And so we beefed up the school feeding program. And then to give a boost to the business sector, because some people make it look like for the, if the business sector is successful, that that's a crime, that people are not supposed to be successful in this country. We found the middle class and the business sector. We can as well shut down this country because the bulk of the money owned by the government or, or earned by the government come through the taxes of these individuals who help to sustain the economy of the country. So what did we do? We said we were going to reduce the VAT. We reduced VAT by 2.5% 
and we were heavily criticized because they said we were giving up $54 million. Well, the fact of the matter is, as we speak today, less than two years after we reduced the VAT, we were back to collecting the same amount of revenue that we were collecting at 12 at 12 and a half percent, we are collecting more revenue than we did at 15 percent. Now that's basic economics. Because if you stifle the economy by overtaxing the people, then people would resist investing. So while we may not have seen a corresponding reduction in the prices of commodities, but what we have seen is an increase in economic activity because the reprieve given to the business sector have encouraged them to invest more, employ more persons, and so we have seen a reduction in unemployment and an increase in consumption, which results in greater returns to the businesses and to the government. So we have, we have been very strategic as a government in our approach, we cannot be extreme. Because when you find a bad situation, you have to manage it gradually. You cannot make drastic decisions because if you make drastic decisions to fix the problem, then you are affecting other areas. Crime remains an issue of concern for all of us. But I always applaud our policemen. And I will say this tonight. We have to decide in this country on whose side we are. Whether we are on the side of the police or whether we are on the side of the criminals. It is time that we draw the lines. Do I always agree with what every policeman does? No. And I'm sure not even the commissioner agrees with everything that some of the officers do. But we cannot categorize all of our police officers as if all of them are bad when these are the same people we expect to protect us every day. And so we must take the right approach towards crime fighting in this country. And crime is very sophisticated now. When the criminals can say we have better weapons than the police officers, because there have been lack of proper investment in the police in the past, how do we expect that we can draw the lines? And families and parents, we have to begin to take a measure of responsibility for the decay of our society. It cannot be just the government and the police. There is a, no, there is a breakdown of family values in this country. And we have to go back to the basics if we are going to bring St. Lucia to where it needs to be. And so, what we need to understand is a collaborated effort, all of us coming together. And I know as returning nationals, a lot of you would be very concerned. I think healthcare is the greatest concern and security for any returning national to St. Lucia, especially if you come from one of the first world countries. Because there is a certain guarantee that you have when you are in a first world country. I have no fear in saying we are not there yet, but we aspire to be there. And so, when the Prime Minister stood up and said, one of these days, we have to bring our country to a level where you would not need a visa to go to the US. People criticize him, but you have to dream big. You have to have a vision for your country because where we have been, it's not paying off. No St. Lucian should be denied a visa to go to the U.S. if we bring this country up to the standard of living that we think we can attain. So, for security, we've made some investments, but that's not enough yet. We still have a long way to go. There must be change in laws. 
some of the laws on the books, <coughs> the commissioner can tell you, some of them have been pre-independent. Some of the fines that are there, it, it's even pointless to even arrest somebody and take them in for it because it, you, you don't accomplish anything. But you have to do all of that in the midst of running the affairs of the country at the same time. So what we have seen is a measure of confidence in St. Lucia. There are growing sectors. If it was about politics, we have a lot to boast about. But we know that we are far from achieving what we have set out to achieve for St. Lucia. The standards set by this government, we have not attained them, but we are on path. We are on the path to be able to do so. So when we came in, the forensic lab was closed. There were no police patrol boats. The radar systems were down. Our police force was demoralized, and to an extent, they are still demoralized because we have not been able to bring closure to the impacts and the damage that it has done to our country. As to how we found ourselves there, that is for another discussion. But we have to face our reality. And our reality is there are problems that need to be addressed. So the government, we've been this debating about OKEU and moving into OKEU. We've not changed any laws pertaining to OKEU. What we inherited... The Millennium Heights Act was passed by the previous government. Nobody said anything. I was in opposition. I asked what was going to happen to the nurses. I asked the same questions that I am asking now. Nobody was concerned. All of a sudden, people are aware that there is a problem. For you to open the hospital, tell them, show you the study that was done by the University of the West Indies when they are talking. <clears throat> and it shows that we needed to find an, that we needed to find an additional 50 to 70 million to add to the existing budget of the Ministry of Health. Now think of that. You're already running a deficit budget. You need to find another 50 to 60 million dollars to run the new hospital. And these are preliminary estimates. You don't know when you go in there how it is going to work out. <clears throat> so if we say there must be proper planning, proper organizing, and we took a phased approach, because you cannot just go there. A hospital is not a building. A hospital is the services. And if you just... If you just transfer what is at VH to OKEU, you move into a new building, that does not mean that you have changed the quality and the output of what you are given. So there must be proper preparation. And I challenge anybody to show me what preparation was made for moving into OKEU. And the last point I will touch on. So the government has gone into an arrangement with a company who operates hospitals. Not to come and run our hospital. Not to come and own our hospital. But to facilitate the transition. Somebody who has the experience to help us in transitioning from VH to OKEU and to help us through the system for the first year or two years, after which everything, so all they are is consultants, but the hospital would be run by our local people in St. Lucia. And St. Jude is going to be my last point that I touch on. Lots of discussions, lots of criticisms. Every day we investigate St. Jude we see more and more the disaster that happened down there. And I just said it on a program in focus during this week. When we were breaking down one of the walls, you know what we found? We found a hot water line, not insulated, 
together with about 20 electrical lines. Together. So you cannot tell which one is the water line and which one is the conduit for the electrical line. Now, basic common sense would tell anybody for a hospital that was destroyed by fire to have your hot water line which is going to generate a certain amount of heat when the hot water goes through there together with the electrical lines. And we have the photos, we have all the evidence to show what we are seeing. Then we go to the roof of the building. And what they did was they put a two by four in the wall and they cast the two sides of the two by four with no rim beam, no steel, and they nailed the rafters straight into the two by four that is just sitting inside the concrete with some nails holding the two by four in place between the concrete. But everybody tells me, this government finished St. Jude and send the people there. And 10 years down the road, the building collapsed. There's a fire. More people died. You know who you'd want to put in prison? Who finished the hospital? That is who we would want to hold accountable for it. Because you know what you tell me? That's what you all were elected for. We elected you all to fix the problem. So if there's a problem, you should have fixed it. Not come and tell us, well, we were under pressure and we had to do that. And so today, we are building a proper hospital, contrary to what you are hearing, we have DCA approval, nothing that was done previously, there was no DCA approval. And I say to people, if you want to do things properly, it comes at a cost. The cost may not only be money, but time. And one of the greatest costs to us for fixing or for building St. Jude properly is the cost of time, not the money. And so I assure you, any 10 years down the road and the hospital is being built for seismic resistance, that is for earthquake, and it is being built hurricane resistant. Because we are putting a concrete roof, we are not putting galvanized on the roof. So it is a building that is supposed to endure the worst weather conditions that we can expect. Because we cannot be asking the rest of the world to help us with resilience. But when it comes to us, we are doing our things haphazard. I can spend the whole night and tell you things. But I know you have your own questions and concerns. I want to give you the assurance. Our building of a new St. Lucia is not just physical structures, but systems. As of January 3rd, you will be able to apply for your driver's license online, and from your living room, you will be able to pay for your driver's license. And if you want it mailed to you, we will mail it to your home for you. And for all St. Lucians living abroad who want to renew their driver's license, they can pay for it from overseas, wherever they are, and they will be able to get the license mailed to them. Because we are going into Digigo, putting more services online. For those of you who have problems with DCA, with health approval, with transport and all of that, all of these services, by the middle of next year, will be online. The first phase of it is the licensing part, which is going to happen on the 3rd of January. And my police officers, every ticket that is issued, we want you to give us the record, because alongside the person's license will be the tickets that they have been issued. So when you come to pay your license, it will flag that you have five tickets that you have not paid. And unless you pay it, you cannot renew your driver's license. And I'm happy I'm addressing the, the, our returning nationals tonight and the diaspora who's following us. Because you know how this works in the first world countries. 
So if your vehicle license is not paid, then your driver's license, if it shows that your vehicle was on the road and you have not paid, then you would not be able to renew your driver's license. And it's going to send a signal straight back to the police to say that person's license is due and they have not paid it. So rest assured, if you're on the road, you will be picked up. Because we have to begin maintaining law and order in the little things so that we can control the bigger ones. I give you the assurance, the government is working to make St. Lucia a better and a safer place for all of us. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. I'm sure he ended on a high note with that driver's license issue. It's something that every single driver in St. Lucia has complained about. I can say that with no fear, right? Every single person, including myself, who needs to renew your driver's license, it's a headache. So, Honorable Minister, thank you very much, and thank you to the government of St. Lucia. Hopefully, as the minister indicated, by halfway next year, we should be getting online our passports, our um, red land registry, birth certificates, and, and so forth, most of these things. We're doing it in phases so that you can go online and you can get access to those information. At this point in time, ladies and gentlemen, we have a microphone to the back. Is it on? We're going to turn on both microphones to the back. And if you have any questions or concerns that you wish to address to either Her Excellency or Minister Joseph, or any question in general that you would like to have answered, we're now opening the floor for your questions, concerns, or comments. And if you do want to commend the meeting, you can also do so. I want to say good night to the Minister of Government, whoever is here, you know. Uh, Miss Minister, I do not know what you're Minister for, but um, you, you spoke about the police and the nurses and other people are not, they are on the paid in my country. But most importantly, the thing that you don't look at is the little man who voted for the for the government of this country. And we are not looking about them. You cannot tell me that uh, a mason or join and those guys are getting $110 a fortnight. A, a lab way. Listen to me. I am telling it to you. And I'm tell, I am there. And I'm going to tell you that it is happening right now. As I'm speaking to on, on Monday, when you see people go to work, those things are happening. A lab away, what they call, I don't, I, I forgot it. A laborer is getting $60 a fortnight. When we have a little girl at Julian's, Julian's are getting $600 a fortnight. I can show you, I can, I can, I can, I can bring you in those places. And we have foreigners right now in this country having people working for them, building for them next to nothing. Mr. Minister of Government, Acting Prime Minister, we need to take care of the little man who voted for the government in this country. We need to take care of those people. They are not getting anything. We need to speak on the behalf of those people. Nothing is happening for us in this country, I can tell you that. The little man, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Um, what I would like to do perhaps is after the meeting have an engagement with you because it is very concerning if you say people are making $60 a fortnight. Um, so perhaps what I would do after the meeting is have a one-on-one -on -one with you to seek clarification in some of the issues that you've raised. Thank you very much. Anybody else? I said $60 a fortnight. Yes. $60 a day, which is wrong. Sorry. $60 a day. Sorry, 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 sorry. I said $60, you know, sometimes we get to my... Yes, my yes, shirt. yes. <laughs> but it is $60 a day, which is wrong. And I'm a little girl getting that at JQ. 
600 dollars a fortnight and a, a liberal is getting 600 dollars a fortnight that is a lot of nonsense we can still speak about it yes we after. will okay yes thank you mr joseph i'd just like to ask a question um i'm sidetracking a bit the point the gentleman was trying to make i think you touch on it is the divide between the public and the private sector mm -hmm. they need to be closer in line I don't know how you're going to fix that, but it's not my responsibility. My, my situation is, I've returned from England, my wife and I, we live here. Um, one of the, part of the discussion that was spoken about was that um, those of us who were, were returning as residents, we are coming to open businesses and, and so forth. But in a way of speaking, I've worked my socks, that is my expression, I've worked my socks in England, and I don't have the inclination, nor the desire, to open the business. Here, I partly owned a small bus company where I've got shares in it, I'm a stakeholder, and I drove, I drove the bus. I drove double-decker double buses in England. I've held that license since 1998. Now, me as a returning resident, applying for a solution driver's license, the most I could be offered is a car's driving license. And you'd appreciate the road conditions that we have. Living in canneries, I could be driving cars up to castles every day on bumpy roads. So I've got a pickup. Now, at the minute, I'm driving a pickup illegally. I've held a British driver's license since 1987. Yeah? Um, as you'd appreciate, the British and the European system has had the most rigorous driving assessments. Yeah? Now, I don't understand how, how I've proved to those people at your transport department that I've driven a bus or I've been driving a bus since 1998. And for them to be issuing me just a car's license, I just don't understand. Okay, so I don't know what you applied for. Um, I can tell you I applied for because I drive a pickup, a pickup truck. That's what I've got. And I stress to the people that I live in Canaries, if I go to commute every day, you know, the, the road condition is so bad that although I've got a car as well, but I don't really want to use the car for safety. So, I've got kids and, and, and so forth. All I can say to you is that sounds unusual because generally that there is a transition from people who have an international license or license from another country where they are allowed to drive vehicles you are talking about the endorsement part of it yes. and so because of our regulations or what the law requires all you are required to do is to go through the basic steps of getting the endorsement. So I don't think you should have a problem based on your experience to get the endorsement. But driving in England does not necessarily mean that you would get an automatic transfer of everything you did there in St. Lucia without going through the system of being able to just go through the process of endorsement. I can look into the matter further. I can speak or I can direct you to go to the transport, the chief transport officer, because that matter can be rectified based on your experience. I'm talking about the standards, the standards of driving Europe and the standard of, the standard of driving here. Because, I, because like I tried to say, I don't have the inclination to even open a business there. It's not that I c I'm not financially able to. My wife and I, she's very much inclined. But like, excuse the expression again, I bought my socks in England. I'm 54. I'm 54 years now. I don't want to, you know, because my, you see, the quality of time that I have now, I never had it in England. Because my wife left home 6.30 in the morning. I got the kids to school. She returned 4 30. I got back 2 o'clock in the morning. So the quality of life wasn't there, and this, is, this was one of the reasons why we moved down here. I've got two boys who are at St. Mary's now. They're 12 year old, they're twins, you know? 
And one of the easiest things I could have done was to have a minibus on the road. But like I said, it's the standard. They've told me that I need to have had your license for five years before I can have an endorsement. But like I said, the standard in England is much greater. It's much more, more vigorous than here. So why is that I can drive a 70 seater coach, 80 seater coach in England, and you're telling me that I cannot drive a pickup here? I, I think you are missing uh, whoever spoke I, to you. May not, because I don't know, even for a St. Lucian who gets their driver's license this year, by the following year can drive a pickup. So I don't even know why anybody would tell you that you have to wait for five years to get an endorsement. I, I'm, not, I'm not doubting what you are saying. All I am saying to you is that matter can be rectified. I think it's a situation of misinformation. I have asked you to, you can go to the chief transport officer I will, um, I think we are taking note of it, and I will raise the matter with them. You can see myself or any of the persons after the meeting, and we would rectify the problem. Just one more small point. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a degree of age discrimination in St. Lucia. Yeah? I, as I said, I'm 54 years old. In England, I could have stayed on work until I'm 70. Yeah? One of the things that I come across is a brick wall every time. I mean, I came in the hope of continuing a PhD. Yeah? I've got a master's in international business management. Yeah? And it was my intention. But because I feel that I've got so much to offer, and, and because of my age, as I understood, retirement age is 65, I cannot even get a job with government, or I've got to go through certain hoops. You know? But my point to you is that we need to, we need to assess that age discrimination thing in St. Lucia. Because we are living longer now. That's what science says. As a result, we can work longer. Because I do not need to have a pension at 65 from government. I, I don't know, in fairness to you, I don't know we have an issue of age discrimination when it comes to driving. Well, Even the public service driver. I'm finished with the driving. Uh -huh. I said employment with government. The driving business. I just want to so. answer you, okay? I, I mean, there are questions that you know, that, but we can't kill the ministers because we are there to answer your questions. Yeah. You are diaspora returning. May I say to you, and that's what we say because this is a meeting of return and returning diaspora. So we are here to answer the questions of return and returning diaspora. There is an office of diaspora affairs. I would like to invite you and your wife to come to our office on the fifth floor of the Prime Minister's building. Our job is to take care of your issues and intercede for you. You bring your problems to our office and we will deal with that because what you're asking the minister here, these things are just misunderstandings and they can. the laws in St. Lucia have changed. People are now retiring even in the public service at 65. So, you know, these things are not issues. So if you come to us, we will explain to you, we will make it easy and we'll make you understand we can take care of anything that you have a problem with. That is what the office is here for. Come to us and we'll answer all your questions. We will call the persons for you. We will explain, we will intercede on your behalf, okay? Thank you. Perhaps the avenues that we've been through haven't been right or, or served us right, but thank you. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a question to, not a question, but a remark to, the, to Dr. Fletcher and uh, the uh, current Deputy Prime Minister, am I correct? Or Acting, Acting Prime Minister. With regards to the, <laughs> with regards to the Acting Prime Minister's question pertaining to global warming and climate change, the Paris Accord, what is the government position with respect to the Paris Accord? Because I believe there is a commitment by the government that by 2030, the current energy use 
should be 20% through alternative sources. Am I correct? Let me just put that in a nutshell perspective so that we can understand. The Caribbean produces less than half percent of the world emission. So if you take it down to St. Lucia now, even if we go 100% green, total renewable energy, that is not going to change anything on the world stage. And I'm relating to the Paris Accord. The arrangements that was made, and, and it's the seeds, small island developing states are the ones suffering the consequences of global warming, while we are the least contributors to global warming. So what was promised, not just the Paris Accord of meeting the objective of 20% renewable by 2030, but there was supposed to be that carbon bank where millions of dollars was supposed, or billions of dollars was supposed to be allocated, and for your carbon credits, you would be able to trade carbon credits for cash. How much of that has materialized today? So we moved away from the green economy, and the new conversation in the world today is the blue economy. And when we sat at the World Bank, IMF, and CDB meetings, I said to them, it looked like y'all are coming up with all fancy phrases to, to move from one. We've not cashed out on the green economy, but you've now brought in the blue economy, which is the ocean. So all I'm saying to you is promises have been made. It has not been materialized internationally. And that is why some countries are now pulling out of that arrangement. But we don't have a choice. Because even if we go green, it does not change our faith. Our faith remains that we are going to be impacted. So going green, we are moving in this direction. Not too long ago, we opened a solar farm, 3.5 megawatts. We look at the number of school buildings and all of the places that is going solar. At the same time, our maximum output for electricity, which is the place that you can go green the, the more, you have the greatest potential to go green. Our maximum output on a peak day is 65 megawatts. So the cost of doing it, what it is going to save us, is foreign exchange, but it is not going to reduce the cost for us initially. Now you look at the size of St. Lucia. Go and look at for three megawatts of electricity, the amount of land space that is occupied. And that is why the approach of the government is output per acre. Every acre of land that is occupied, there's supposed to be a measurement to determine what the output is if we are going to determine our full potential. But it's not a government thing. It is recognized that solar power is the way to go. Even currently, the United States is determining which way to invest their money in terms of energy. So for us in St. Lucia, it would make sense for you to advocate the use of solar and create programs to assist the you know, homeowners, business owners. To so you want me to tell you what our reality is? Please. Here's our reality. We have a, a, an a, agreement with Lucilec that takes us to 2046. And then the, the production of electricity and the return on investment. Because we've had many offers. I'm always at loggerheads with them because of the challenges. We've had programs, projects from waste to energy. We've had solar, we've had wind. We are now working on a geothermal project. But an agreement was signed with UNEC many years ago, and we have millions of dollars sitting down, waiting in the World Bank to be cashed out. But because we cannot get rid of the previous agreement with UNEC, 
until we have closed that, the World Bank is not going to give us, and that's grant funding. So when governments make decisions to go into certain arrangements, it has implications. Many years ago, they went into with UNEC. So we are weighing all of our options, wind, solar, geothermal. These are the ones we have li looked at liquefied natural gas. I can tell you for the transport sector, we are already looking at the possibility of conversion of the, the existing buses to using the liquefied natural gas rather than the fuel, which is diesel or gas, which has a much greater impact on the economy. But these things happen in strides. There, there's no one, one switch and everything changes. Deputy Prime Minister, I'm not talking about government math. I'm take hold of involvement in power, personal power. I'm talking about what is the government policy with respect to the popular people, the, I mean the people, the homeowners, the residents. They can have solar system in their homes. What incentives do you or there's, your government have with respect to there's helping duty, the residents? There's duty free for everything. Mr. Bola, do you, you, you want to say anything on this? So the St. Lucia Development Bank, we have a facility which is facilitated through the government from the World Bank, where we provide a low-cost loan for persons to convert to all of these um, alternative energy uses. It's something that we have ads running on the TV, we speak about it at all forums, where persons can, and we have, a, we have advisors at the bank who will assist in directing persons who want to have solar panels on their roofs for both water solar panels for the, the PV systems to have the electrical generation for themselves. So, so, so there is, there so, are, the government is facilitating this. So what I'm hearing here is you are able to offer what you call soft loans to homeowners yeah. in order for them to have solar system on the homes? Yeah. Well, that should be, I mean, the whole island should know about it. You know that? Okay, okay. So um, maybe, maybe I'll just help as well. Just <laughs> okay. And, and it's, it, we, we're actually taking it to another level in that we're just about to launch a competition in the schools. So every person will, um, every child at, at the secondary schools is going to be asked to go home and identify the issues at their homes. And the winner will be, we will fund the winner to you know, promote whatever um, project that they identify, which will be looking at alternative energy, and even you know, if they have to make themselves more re resilient, because it's all about vulnerability as well. Very well. Very good. Um, <laughs> very good. Um, to Dr. Fletcher, I believe you have something going here. Um, earlier you spoke of um, how there are um, more St. Lucians in the diaspora than at home, and you're quite right. And the office you are running, if it is run properly, and well, it might eventually become a ministry for the government. Because you have the potential to bring in people like me and many others to come back home and do business. So if this is run well, and I sense a passion in your presentation for that office, and it's very good. So keep it on, and I believe we need to be given some sort of more incentives, especially the business, those of us coming back to the business, there should be a little bit more incentive because what we are given is too timid. It is lukewarm, it's not, it's not inviting. But I must say, my engagement with various offices, the people, the personnel are very helpful. They're very good. They want to help, but for some reason, it's not lavish enough. So, Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, if you want economic activities, economic acting Prime Minister, if you want economic activities, business to be thriving, you have to let go the entrepreneur, the, 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 the people. Let us come in. Roll the red carpet to us. Bring us in. We are ready to do business. You've sat here, you've worked with us, you've come to the office, you have been with us. And I thank you that you've recognized that there's this passion. But as I said, again, my unfailing resource team, they can answer 
anything. And as you see, Mr. Boland answered, you come any issue you, the diaspora, have, they're there. And why are they there? Why is this office there? The government has laid out the red carpet for the diaspora, and we are saying, welcome, come in, we value you, we want you, and you ask for the incentive, here it is. The team is here, we are here, we welcome you. Our dollars, my dollar stays right here. The yes. international investor, we know that. where is the dollar? We know that, that's why we're doing what we're doing now. Thank you, thank you very much. Hello, I'm a solution living in the diaspora. Um, I'm really heartened and impressed and happy to hear some of this information that you've shared with us. Um, you know, really, really pleased. Um, I've got a couple of frustrations, and um, they're just tiny, but I just thought I'd mention them. And adding to what one my, um, one of the gentlemen said regarding um, licenses, um, I'd like to ask why, is, why isn't um, the temporary three-month license still available on the airport? Because I came in about four weeks ago, and um, this is the second time, because I come home every year, and I'm actually um, on my gradual um, return to, to live back home. Um, but when I came in this year, um, and last year as well, and I've come in twice this year, um, I was not able to get the temporary license on the airport. So when the, the, the tourists come, because they're gonna hire a car, they're allowed to, to, to get a, a license from Avis and the other car rental places on the airport. But then for me, I have, I've had to go to a petrol station in um, Viewfort. Um, they didn't have any. And then I, I went to the police station who said to me they didn't have any. And I've been going from pillar to post to try to get a three month temporary license. That was really, really frustrating. And I think they should, because they used to be, you used to be able to get them when you were coming, driving out. You know, why is that not available anymore? Um, the, no, but yeah, that's a three month, the temporary three month license. So are you saying that you're not renting a car, but perhaps you have family who has a car? Yeah, I've, yeah, because I'm solution, I have contacts. So I want to rent a car, but then I can't because I have to get that three month license first. Okay. And it's not made, it used to be available on the airport. Mm -hmm. And then it started being available when you drive out. But then now, you, you know, it's just not available at all. So you need to go to the petrol station in Viewfort. And then the last two years, it's not been, you know, I went there, they, they told me about the papers run out and this and that and, and the other, and I was not able to get it. Do you have any order just before the minister comes? I'll just record yes, them. Yes. Um, Do you have any yeah. order? Right. Just, a, just a couple more things. I'm not, um, I've been hearing a lot of, um, oh yeah, before I go on to that, in terms of the airport, I'm, it's really impressive and um, there was a lot of, you know, I have seen it, you know, back in London, I've seen loads of footage and, and stuff about the airport. Um, and that's great, but I also want to just make a, a small reference to the custom officials. I hope in accordance with the new airport, we have a new attitude because I see that, and, and I, I, you know, I'm on, I'm on lots of Facebook, I'm on loads of Facebook groups in London. I'm not only representing St. Lucia, but representing um, the, you know, the other islands. And um, they all talk about, you know, the, the attitude of the, the custom officials when they come in. And when I come in too, um, I always um, see the difference, distinct difference between the treatment of nationals as opposed to tourists. So you, you, they come in and it's not, it's not only the, the fact that they open their suitcases and empty everything out, but it's also the fact that they the, you know, the, the comments that are made, even with me, sometimes I come in, and I've got a British passport, but I was born in St. Lucia, so I come in, and then they open my case and say, well, do you have presents for, you know, people? I'd say, well, my parents live here, so, and they, they would say, oh, well, is that not a present, and is that not, I mean, you know, this, this is really disheartening, and when you're on a long haul flight, you know, and you're stressed and you're looking forward to coming home and seeing loved ones and family, you really don't want to be facing that level of stress. So in accordance with the new airport, I hope there's a new, you know, um, determination, a new drive, a new attitude towards, um, you know, nationals and tourists. 
And the last thing I want to ask um, is, I know Dr. Fletcher spoke a lot about the, the actual um, diaspora database. Um, I give my details, you know, does that mean I'll be added to that and, and I'll be getting info? How do I go about being added to it and getting information? I'm not currently, I'm not currently. Well, I've just given that. Is that? Then I'm on. Okay. All right. So all information around concessions coming back, all that will be there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. So let me see if I can just take your concerns in sequence. The issue of the driver's license, I know that it's more confined now to the driving schools, um, but not driving schools, I mean car rental companies. We are hoping that with the new introduction that we are doing, that you can make your arrangements online for your license prior to arriving. And you, you may find that because we are going through a transition process now that I was not aware that you could not get it, so I'm taking note of that because these things, if they are not brought to our attention, sometimes you, you're not aware as the minister that that's actually a problem. So we are going to look into it. On the issue of the customs, we are in discussions and in, at an advanced stage of going to border control as opposed to just dealing with just the issue of customs. Don't feel special. All of us go through it. Yes. So, um, I mean, I've had my share of, of and, and all of us. And I, I really think that we need and I say, not just in St. Lucia, across the Caribbean. I, I go into the U.S. and these places a lot easier than going to another Caribbean island. And I find that on the CARICOM and under this, and I can well understand why our returning nationals would feel the way that they are feeling. But as we indicated earlier, it's a work in progress, and we are hoping that people gradually would pick up and understand that everybody is not coming to St. Lucia and now it's 50 pounds you have in a suitcase. What can you really carry in, in a suitcase? And sometimes I find it is stretched beyond what it should be, but the, the customer relations, I think, is what needs to be addressed. I guess when I'm a minister, I don't, I'm not exposed to the same things that you expose. But I can tell you, when I was in opposition, it was not nice. If I tell you how I used to be searched when I came in. But that's the reality of our country. And when we appeal to the citizenry and we say to people, our approach must be different in St. Lucia. We must begin to do things in the proper manner. But generally speaking, I don't think that our customs officers are bad in and of itself. You, you may come across the occasional person who may give you a tough time. We all have had our share, but I take on what you have said, and we are hoping that with the new facility, and the better layout that we are going to have, you are going to have more of the scanners in place because our security is going to be beefed up and because of the method of security, because what we are also looking at with the new airport is that, for example, if you travel in first class or business class, your business class or first class service should not end when you get off the, the, the plane, but it should continue way after you, you've left there, to the point where maybe if you go into a hotel or somewhere, that your luggage can even be delivered there to you. So we are definitely thinking outside of the normal way of doing things. It's not just a facility we are building that is beautiful, but we expect that the services would be on par with the facility that we are establishing.
I am hoping, not only waiting for the facility, but almost immediately, those of us who are returning home, whether we carry American passport, Canadian passport, which I carry, British passport, that we are treated equal to the tourists and do not feel as if we are second-class citizen. I am very, very strong about that because I have been subjected to certain comments, certain attitudes that no one should be subjected to that when you are coming home. When I get to Canada, they say to me after I show my passport, welcome home. When I get to St. Lucia, they say, what have you got to declare? <laughs> That's the difference. Okay, now, <laughs> you have made a lot of points in the talk that is both the diaspora ambassador and yourself. I first have to congratulate your government for all the infrastructure building that I see that you were doing. You need to be congratulated. But healthcare for most of us, like people like me, is very, very important. And I am looking towards the day that St. Jude will be open and we in the South can walk in there and get some quality and proper service. One of the questions about the St. Jude is earlier on when your government came in, I heard report that you were doing a forensic in, um, audit in terms of what transpired in St. Jude. There was a lot of hoopla, but I have not heard anything about the result or whether or not people were held into account for what happened at St. Jude. So that's number one. Number two, I think our group very concerned about traffic safety. And we are asking what is going to be done to ensure better traffic safety on our roads. One of the concerns we have when you have to go and renew your license, that's your vehicle license, you are supposed to go for an inspection. An inspection is supposed to determine, I believe, whether your vehicle is roadworthy. Okay? You go to those establishment and the clerk in the office takes the form that you had before and put check, 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 and they don't even look to see the mileage or if your light comes on, if your tire is properly in inflated, and they say $40 or $45, and they give you a piece of paper. I would ask that better check be done on how those people who've been given contract to do vehicle instruction, because it has happened to me. I went to Viewfort, had an inspection, had my license, driving back home when I hit Elen. How many people know where Elen is? When you leave Canals before you reach Deriso Gap, that flat area, I heard boom. One of my tires shattered, and if I did not have good driving skills, I would be dead. So that's three. The other thing we are concerned is, why is it because you are 60 or 65, every three years you have to have a driver's test? Because right now I will say to you, 60 is the new 40. <laughs> 75 is the new 50. And 85 is the new 60. So we have to recognize that 
though the years are there, we have to recognize that the skills are still there, the faculties are still there, and what is the need of having a driver's test when you've been driving probably 40 or 50 years? So okay. this is another area we would like that some attention will be paid to. Thank you. Okay, so let me see if I can, I'll take from the bottom first, the, the last question raised, that of the why at that age you need a driving test. And I will tell you, when that idea came up, when that change of legislation came up, I was in parliament in opposition, and I raised objection to it in opposition. The then prime minister said to me, I will be, that's referring to himself, the first person in the parliament subjected to that. So if I don't have a problem with it, why should you have a problem with it? We, we cannot go and change laws every day. That, that, that's, it, it makes us look like we don't know what we are about. I, I was in favor of people who drive public service vehicles, who commute the public, to have been scrutinized to that level, but to, be, to subject the rest of the population. And I'm telling you, my personal feeling on this, what they do for a test is no test at all. You, you just go, and I said to them, if you want to charge a fee, charge a fee, but don't subject our elderly to that type of, of, of exposure. But it is the law, and until we change it, it remains that that is the requirement. On the issue of the inspection, that remains a sore point for us because it is something that is managed more by the insurance council along with the Ministry of Transport where there are certified garages. Now, there are some garages who do that. But other, there are other garages who would put you through the proper test. What the concern has been is, by right, the inspection is supposed to take about 45 minutes. If you go through, no. And it has been an issue of, well, if you are going to pay me $45, or $40 to do an inspection, what do you expect from me? Because, so, there are issues with this, but safety, we cannot put a price on safety. And that is why we are trying to revise as many of the laws as possible as it pertains to roadworthiness of vehicles, the issue of safety, and what we expect to happen so that we can make our road safer. I can tell you this week, we are observing um, with the rest of the world, um, world safety, um, road safety awareness, under the theme, you are not a car part. That, but St. Lucia really have too many accidents. And 90% of the accidents are pure carelessness. Not anything that should happen. So we are hoping but the government has taken an approach to make the road safer. So you would see a lot of areas that did not have these railings and these barriers and road signs and road markings and all of that. All of that is taking place today. What we need to be able to change is driver behavior and attitude. And that is something that is with the individual. We hope that with the new system we have, we will have the demerit point system in place. So after you lose a certain amount of points, you don't have to go to court for a magistrate. You would automatically lose your driver's license and go back to driving school so that you can, you can relearn to drive properly to come back and get a driver's license. Is that it? Yes. On the St. Jude matter, um, 
We did, we did not do a forensic audit at first. We did a technical audit. The technical audit was to make a determination on the structure of the building and whether it met the requirements of a hospital. As we speak today, all of the findings of both the technical audit and the financial audit is with the office of the Attorney General and the lawyers engaged by the government. But once it reaches that stage, it is beyond the involvement of the minister. I cannot give a directive as to what should happen. It is based on the findings that they are going to act. And from my standpoint, I expect action to be taken because there is sufficient from what we saw in the report on the basis that we were building an institution just purely on that without any DCA approval was sufficient grounds. Today I'm being criticized for building St. Jude without DCA approval, when we have DCA approval, but yet still there was no criticism, I've not heard any criticism from the same persons for building the monstrosity we have down there without any DCA approval and failing the basic requirements of safety. The fire test was failed by the present construction that we have for St. Jude. Not the new one we're building, what was there before. So, I wait on the AG and the, the other departments of government to guide us at the next stage. Um, I did some traveling recently to the Dominican Republic, Belize, and I made an observation that the tourist project is so cheap. Like, if you, go and, um, if you go and buy something there or you try to rent a hotel, they, they are almost half the price of St. Lucia. Now, this, this is going to be a challenge to the heart of our economy. What is St. Lucia doing to answer this challenge? I mean, because it so happened that these two countries, they are the fastest growing um, tourist island, um, tourist destination in the Caribbean. So is, 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 the, is, the, is the government aware of that? And are, are, are you guys uh, responding to that challenge? Yes. Um, we are high-end destination. We, we, we are not a mass tourism destination. We are high-end. Then the, the second point is that the cost of doing business in St. Lucia is generally higher than these places. Now, so you look at volume. You look at the effort, you look at the hotel accommodation, you look at the cost of labor. And while the gentleman raised the issue about the price, these same Dominican Republic people who came down to St. Lucia and worked on the Royalton Hotel, a lot of them never returned. And they are working for half the price that St. Lucians are working for because they are accustomed in their own country to work for these prices. These, these are our realities. Electricity in St. Lucia, as an example, maybe over 30 cents a kilowatt hour. In, if I take Trinidad as an example, 4 cents a kilowatt hour. So for the other gentleman who said that we need to roll out the red carpet and give the incentives, that is why the government gives all of the incentives that it gives to that sector to make us attractive because in the other areas we cannot compete. So we have to be able to offer something that would make us an attractive destination. So we have the beauty, we have the landscape, we have the friendliness of our people. We have all of this going for us. What we have to do now is to find ways to reduce in cost. And I know in the meeting we had with the electricity company, we are targeting how we can have a reduction in the cost of electricity, which is one of the greatest outputs or, or cost for any of the hotels operating here. Then you look at the cost of water. You look at the cost of transportation from the airport to the hotel. 
So that is why we are not focused on these 5,000 room hotels, but we are into the niche market of honeymooners because when you're getting married or you're making up or, 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 or you, don't, you don't put a price to that. Okay, okay. You don't put a price to that. It, it, it's, for many people, it's once in a lifetime event. And that is why St. Lucia, I know the Minister of Tourism just indicated to us just during the week, once again, St. Lucia has captured the crown as the leading honeymoon destination in the world for this year again. So we are aware that we have challenges. And that is why our approach is we need to at least double the number of hotel rooms that we have. If we have more hotel rooms, because you have a critical number that will help you to reduce price. So we had 4,500 hotel rooms. If we can get to 7,000 hotel rooms, what it does is it attracts more people, more airlines would come, greater competition, then the price of the airfares would drop, and then you would begin to see the benefits of being able to reduce the cost. But we cannot reduce the cost significantly. So when even our people criticize us and say, oh, why are you giving all of these incentives to the hotels? That's the only thing we have to offer them to be able to attract them to come into St. Lucia outside of the beauty and what we offer as a country. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Go ahead, please. I will keep mine short. My concern has been spoken about earlier, but not in the way that I am going to put it. I am concerned about the speed limit, the drive-in on the roads of St. Lucia. Even coming here, I had to brake three times, approaching the hill, because a car in the opposite direction was overtaking, and I had to brake, otherwise it would have been a head-on collision. I am really concerned about how people are overtaking at a bend, overtaking on a hill, without seeing what's coming in the opposite direction. And that's my concern. It is very, very dangerous. And I have been driving over 45 years, and I am a fast driver, but not on the roads that we have here. Minister, I think it's unfortunate that the Commissioner of Police has left with reference to traffic, but let's see. Yes, um, I mean, the Commissioner, Commissioner and I, we've had regular discussions about this thing. One of the areas that we are lacking is sufficient patrol vehicles specifically for traffic. And we, we are trying to address this problem because what we've said is nobody should drive between Castries and Viewfort and not encounter at least two specific patrol vehicles that pertains to traffic. And the same should apply for grocery. Because if it's only one vehicle you have, when they see that vehicle, then they know I'm not seeing another vehicle again. But it all boils down to attitude. We have to do a lot, and people see the driver's license as a right. They need to start to see it as a privilege that is given, because you cannot endanger people by the way you drive. We, we are concerned about guns and these things, but when we look at it between, for the last 10 years, We've had more than 190 road fatalities in St. Lucia, a small country like ours, and over 1,200 serious injuries to people. There is no reason why a country of this size should have this number of road fatalities. And it is just because of the attitude that people have when they sit behind the steering wheel of a vehicle. We are hoping that there's going to be a greater concerted effort, 
not just by the police because the police cannot be everywhere but that we in St. Lucia would begin to change our attitude towards how we drive in St. Lucia to make it safer but through the law we will do what we can one of the things we are doing we are building a vehicle pound so when we are when we find you as you indicated and your vehicle does not meet the roadworthiness specifications we do not allow you to drive that vehicle home we call the wrecker and we take the vehicle to the pound and in due course you will pay and do the necessaries because if we can curb the problems in traffic we can reduce a lot of the criminal activity that is taking place in St. Lucia today. Because it starts small and then it grows. So that is the approach we want to take. I want to tell you, we are not where we want to be yet. We are aware of the problems. And it is our intention to work until we can solve it. Okay, so tonight I, on behalf of the Prime Minister, who I know he really wanted to be here, while I was at the table, he called me and he said, please convey my regards to the, the diaspora, the returning nationals, and the people in general. He's very hard-pressed. Um, he's negotiating with um, some things with the U.S. government, and it, he was not scheduled to travel this week. But because, um, and those of you who followed the news would have seen that they had some meetings with Congress and in terms of what we are doing in St. Lucia, and that is why he had to be out of state. I, I trust that the team represented here today have brought some level of satisfaction to, to the concerns that you have raised and to let you know that we value the diaspora. We are moving in Parliament to change some of the legislation so that even the second generation can be entitled to their St. Lucian passports. And that because sometimes it is limited, then we have another one where um, if the husband is married, then the, the wife gets easy access. But if it is the lady, then the husband has a difficulty. We are moving to change that, to put you all on same level, so that whether it's a man or a woman who's married outside, then they're entitled to the same benefits coming back to St. Lucia. So I want to assure you that the government is working. We value your contribution whether it be in the form of remittances that you have sent to support your family and your loved ones in St. Lucia, or whether you are returning national who have come back to re-establish in St. Lucia, in whatever form that it is, your contribution is appreciated and recognized, and we look forward to continuing to work with you to make St. Lucia what we all can be proud of. I thank you and God bless. But before you go, I just wanted to correct one thing, and I know my diaspora is them singing. Yes, we know second de generation diaspora can get their passports. I know you've been killing the government for the third generation, and that is the policy that's being looked at now for third generation. So don't start getting the thing and think, no, oh, they're not looking at third. It is third is being looked. At, along with the other things the minister tell you. And I want to say to you, my lady here, I am making a suggestion to the government just like you to look. I like data and statistics. The same way I'm giving them the statistics to say how many of you returning or how many of you diaspora are invested in St. Lucia so that they can make their policies to, to benefit you. I am also going to tell them to check the statistics about how many Road fatalities and our, our road accidents are from the young people or the old people, so they can look at the age policy as well. Okay? A pleasant good evening to each and everyone here, and um, especially those that are up front. I just want to thank, um, I want to express my sincere gratitude, especially to Mistress Fletcher 
and um, for helping me out by renewing my passport. I'm proud to be a St. Lucia. I am very, very proud to be a St. Lucia as well as an American. And, um, and it wasn't any problem I had to go through in getting this passport. As long as I had the, the, the opportunity to reach this woman, Mrs. Fletcher, and she, she <laughs> introduced me to her secretary, and she referred me also to her, and she said she's going to help me. And this woman put her best out to help me get this passport. And knowingly that I am a widow, just had my husband pass a few months ago. And um, there is a concern that I really want to bring to you. Um, even as a widow, I, I have not heard anybody spoken of, um, spoken of, of uh, being a widow coming from or being a U.S. citizen and also a born St. Lucian. And knowing that I've returned here and lost my husband five months ago and I'm still waiting to hear from the U.S. government, they're seated and struggling myself out to survive. How can I know that the government cares about that? When my deceased husband was very, very close to the government of St. Lucia, especially Michael Chastney. And this man did a lot of work for this island, helping Mr. Chastney, knowing, building that foundation for St. Lucia because he was a very wise man. And Mr. Chastney couldn't do without this man. He was his second hand. And when he passed, my God, he said, um, Alan Chastney, he referred Alan Chastney to me stating that, you know, he has passed and there is something that must be done. And he promised to see me. I've never seen him. I've never heard him, nor a call. But I'm wondering what is happening. If I'm not a born St. Lucian, that there's no one who really cares. I only saw our representative once. I've never heard of him. I've ne never heard from him. And I've never seen him since then. So I'm asking the question. I am, am I not a born St. Lucian? that someone is or will be concerned or should be concerned about a widow who lost her husband five months ago that was very close to the government who had to work and always willing to work with the government and you know just helping them out of how to do things where to do it and you know and you know he was just a famous man with along with the government and you know i just i just want to say well that i don't know what to say again but i know that i had to stand here to really dish it out because i am concerned about what is the government doing about you know widows that of, that has left the U.S. and come and stay in St. Lucia and has lost their loved ones. Please accept my sympathies with the passing of your husband. So what I would do after, um, not to show what channels was used to communicate for a meeting or meet up with the Prime Minister. After the meeting, I will come to you and get your contact details and try to arrange for that meeting so you can speak to the Prime Minister. And also, I will pass on your details 
Excellency to Her Excellency as well, and then we can we can have a dialogue. But I am truly sorry, and I do apologize, and I'm so sorry about you. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You've been a wonderful audience. 